What you're about to see is non-corporatized news, specifically talking about movements that the mainstream media doesn't want to talk about, like Antifa. And we need your help to keep bringing the truth to the fore. So to become a patron of our show, Act Out, visit patreon.com slash act out. This week on Act Out, anti-fascism then and now. How did we get to this absurdity that we now call our government today? And what makes a fascist a fascist? On the flip side, what makes an anti-fascist an anti-fascist? And how can we fight and build in this brave new world? Next up, activists battle the big oil minions in DC. And finally, part one of our two-part interview series with anarchist, author, and organizer Scott Crow. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. Welcome to Act Out. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. You've seen them on TV, black-clad activists marching against and even openly fighting with neo-Nazis, nationalists, and white supremacists. Since the election, anti-fascists have seemingly been everywhere, online and in the media. Some call them terrorists, others call them heroes, but really they're just people, like you and me. People who hate fascism. Who are the Antifa, where do they come from, and what really is fascism anyway? A question that's no longer simply academic. Across the US, and indeed in Europe too, far-right forces are growing in power. Whether they call themselves nationalists or claim to be opposed to radical Islam while targeting innocent Muslims for threats and violence, the bad old days are coming back around again on Insanity's Loop. May Day in Austin, Texas. As part of a full day of events celebrating the traditional international workers' holiday, a coalition of communists and some anarchist supporters had planned a march through downtown Austin, similar to radical May Day marches that happen in cities across the world, and in the U.S., like Portland. Small events like it had occurred in the Texas Capitol in 2015 and 16, but this year, a group of fascists had another idea. Heavily armed counter-protesters converged on the radical march from two sides, surrounding them and preventing them from effectively moving through the downtown area. At times, they violently attacked. At least one activist was sucker-punched. Many of them were the 4chan trolls, the denizens of the online message board that once upon a time gave birth to the anonymous hacktivist collective, but since then has taken a dark, dark and dangerous turn. These groups are now regular disruptive presences at Texas protests, and one of them, William Fears, is known to have brandished a knife at indivisible activists in the Houston airport during protests against Trump's Muslim ban. Joining these Pepe the Frog-worshipping douchebags were members of Open Carry Texas, a Second Amendment rights group <clears throat> known for intimidating displays of firepower during local festivals and even in restaurants, because yeah... And standing side by side with them were members of White Lives Matter. Whites appropriate everything. White Lives Matter was called by the Southern Poverty Law Center, a neo-Nazi group that is growing into a movement as more and more white supremacist groups take up its slogans and tactics. And lest you think I'm exaggerating by calling them fascists, here is some footage to uh, dispel that. I like blacks. I like everybody. I'm sure you do. I'm I don't sure like you do. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like Jews. Okay, well, what's, what's up? Good? Yeah, well, but surprise, I don't surprise. like white like, 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 like people. Too. <laughs> I'm a troll. Oh, hi. Troll. oh hi. Hi. No, he, he, can put his, he can put his white power symbol on my face. I don't care. Hey, motherfucker. My name is William Pierce. I don't have a man. I'm a fucking fascist. I'm a fucking Nazi. What the fuck are you going to do about it? Tell me. There you go, so just like that dumbass. No 
That a march by communists, socialists, and anarchists would draw out a diverse coalition of far-right and fascist groups should disturb you, not just because of the potential for violence against activists like you and me, but it's also because it's a sign that right-wing groups are working together and becoming more organized, powerful, and more determined than ever to stomp out the left. And this kind of thing isn't just happening in Austin, Texas. Organized fascist far-right groups are marching, rallying, and targeting leftists from Portland to Oakland to Boston. And these groups are diverse in age, too. Bringing together not just aging Klansmen who've shucked off their white sheets, but young people radicalized on the internet in places like 4chan and Reddit. And Alex Jones. And hearkening back to last week's free speech episode, this isn't about letting people have their dissenting opinions. This is about people coming to a peaceful event, looking to literally beat progressive values out of people. And that, that is not free speech. That is fascism. But Eleanor, you're just throwing that word around. What really is fascism? And how does it appeal to so many people at a time like this? Well, according to the Google, fascism is, quote, an authoritarian and nationalistic right-wing system of government and social organization. Now, as we've covered in the past, our system of government is uh, pretty squarely an oligarchy and plutocracy forged by capitalism sprinkled with authoritarian snowflakes that show up whenever a black person is uh, standing on a street corner or something equally egregious. I'm not here to say that we live in a fascist state. I am here to say that we live in a state with fascists, social organizations of nationalistic right-wing extremists. So you may have heard talk of how Trump appealed primarily to impoverished white people with so-called economic anxiety. And while some working class whites did vote for Trump and the Democrats and Hillary Clinton should be criticized and have been on the show for failing to bring in many poor whites who voted for Obama in 08 and 2012, historically these groups frequently vote for Republicans regardless of who the candidate is. As reported by The Nation, the voters Clinton really lost, the ones she was targeting and relying on for victory, were college-educated whites. Most polling suggested she would win these voters, but she didn't, according to exit polls. White men went 63% for Trump versus 31% for Clinton, and white women went 53-43%. Among college-educated whites, only 39% of men and 51% of women voted for Clinton. And historically speaking, these are exactly the groups that we'd expect to see supporting nationalism, white supremacy, and the Nazi party in, say, Germany. <clears throat> While working class people have supported these movements, the leadership and the bulk of their members have always come from middle class people, or people sometimes referred to as declassed. They aren't the powerless working poor, who are just as likely to band together against fascism as to join it. Rather, they are upper middle class bosses, landowners, and farmers, people who gained a a small amount of power in the capitalist pie, only to see it stripped away by the continuing consolidation of wealth under the richest 1% or even 0.1%. Trump's promises to drain the swamp appealed to many members of the white poor, but even more so to businessmen and ranchers who loved his promises to drive out foreign capital and foreign businesses and restore them to the power they held decades ago before the rise of globalization and neoliberalism. Indeed, after decades of neoliberal policies stripped the middle class to the roots, these declassed white men saw Trump as a hope for something different and a return to power. In a Day After, a day, day after Election Day article in The Guardian, author Naomi Klein explained the rise of Trump like this. Here is what we need to understand. A hell of a lot of people are in pain. Under neoliberal policies of deregulation, privatization, austerity, and corporate trade, their living standards have declined precipitously. At the same time, they have witnessed the rise of the Davos class, a hyper-connected network of banking and tech billionaires, elected leaders who are awfully cozy with those interests, and Hollywood celebrities who just make the whole thing seem unbearably glamorous. Success is a party to which they were not invited. And they know in their hearts that this rising wealth and power is somehow directly connected to their growing debts and powerlessness. 
for the people who saw security and status as their birthright, and that means white men most of all, these losses are unbearable. Donald Trump speaks directly to that pain. Elite neoliberalism has nothing to offer that pain because neoliberalism unleashed the Davos class. People such as Hillary and Bill Clinton are the toast of the Davos party. In truth, they threw the party. And we the people have to take some blame on this for allowing such a grotesque rise of anti-intellectualism and fact fear drive us into the arms of a psychopathic, dim-witted clown. But through this analysis, we can recognize not only what led us here, i.e. Ne neoliberalism, but also where we could be headed. Our unfolding brand of fascism presents itself on two fronts. It starts at the government level, with hard right-wing legislation designed to hurt the poor and vulnerable. <clears throat> like, for example, Trump Care, the overpriced and loophole-filled replacement to the Affordable Care Act, or the brutal budget Republicans want to push through, which slashes the safety net for millions of Americans who need it the most, like children, veterans, and the disabled. Of course, it seeks to do this with no shortage of jingoist flag-waving, military posturing, and God bless Americas. Outside of the halls of the mighty maniacs, fascism is more overtly supported and grown in the streets. Already back in early 2016, the Southern Poverty Law Center released a report on the rise of hate groups. In 2014, SPLC counted 784 hate groups, compared to 892 in 2015, a 14% increase. Last year, that number increased again to 917. Couple this with the more than 1,000 bias incidents within Trump's first 34 days of office, i.e. attacking women wearing hijab, people of color, women, etc. It's clear that indeed, as this headline notes, fascists of all stripes are feeling free to express their hatred openly. Now, for those of you reaching for a history book to thumb through Germany in the 1930s, it's important to note that while history does repeat itself, that insanity's loop, the style and details always change. This is not post-World War I Germany, nor is it Italy under Mussolini. With that in mind, here are a few mainstay characteristics of fascism as listed by the Holocaust Museum. Take a look and consider the U.S. today. Powerful and continuing nationalism. Disdain for human rights. Supremacy of the military. Rampant sexism controlled mass media, obsession with national security, religion and government intertwined, corporate power protected, labor power suppressed, disdain for intellectuals in the arts, obsession with crime and punishment, rampant cronyism and corruption, and fraudulent elections. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, wow, that sounds like the wet dream and the path of today's Congress, you're not wrong. Luckily, just as there is a history of fascism, there's also a history of anti-fascism. Anti-fascism has its origins in pre-war Germany, when socialists and anarchists fought Nazis in the streets, trying, but ultimately failing to halt their rise to power. After the war, they reorganized again into neighborhood groups called anti-fascistische committees, or even anti-fascistische Aktion. I'm sorry if I'm butchering that. As outlined by Lauren Balhorn in Jacobin magazine, Antifa fought the remnants of the Nazi party while also helping rebuild German society. For example, Antifa in the city of Braunschweig printed a 12-point program demanding, among other things, the removal of Nazis from all administrative bodies and their immediate replacement with competent anti-fascists, liquidation of Nazi assets to provide for war victims, emergency laws to prosecute local fascists, and the reestablishment of the public health care service. While the Antifa ba banner fell out of favor during the middle of the 20th century, the work of fighting fascism definitely continued. And while they haven't always used the label, groups like the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, and the Brown Berets organized to defend their communities by any means necessary, whether that meant armed struggle or patrols, or providing breakfast for hungry school kids left out by the system. Anti-fascism saw a resurgence in the 80s and 90s, often through the punk scene, the anti-racist action movement, and groups mobilizing against white supremacy throughout Europe. Antifa grew even, grew even larger as an organized movement at the dawn of the 21st century, inspired not just by new movements of white supremacists, but also by the anti-globalization movement and the successful use of Black Bloc at the famous Battle of Seattle. 
Black block, block, by the way, a tactic that involves activists masking up and wearing near identical black clothing to hide their identities, has come to be associated with Antifa activism, but the tactic does not belong to any one radical group and has been used for a variety of purposes from, yes, confronting fascists directly to disabling dirty energy project equipment. And though militant black bloc confrontations are sometimes an effective tactic of <clears throat> the anti-fascist movement, they are just one among many. Antifa take part in creating art and music, reading groups and classes, graffiti and street art, intersectional coalition building, and even dressing as clowns to make fascists look like the fools that they are. In one recent example that shows the potential diversity of tactics, Antifa in St. Paul, Minnesota came together with a broad coalition of leftist groups to block attempts by racist South African group to recruit at a Trump rally. Ultimately, they non-violently forced the Trump supporters to denounce the fascist group through social pressure and sheer overwhelming numbers. To be effective, Antifa must be prepared not just to fight, but also to provide appealing political alternatives when both the Republicans and the Democrats have failed to deliver on their promises to the people. At moments like this one, fascism can be dangerously appealing, even to former leftists. As Don Hammersquist wrote in his essay, Fascism and Anti-Fascism, in this country, particularly radical anti-fascists must be prepared to compete ideologically and every other way with fascists who present themselves as revolutionary and anti-capitalist, and to orient towards the same issues and constituencies as the left. Remember, the opposition to trade deals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership came from both the far right and the far left, but the right had totally different reasons for opposing it than we did. To sum it up, anti-fascists believe that we're all on the front lines of this battle, that fascism is a real and growing force and we have to stop it, no matter what. And that doesn't mean that everybody has to go out and find a Nazi to punch. Whether it's covering up racist graffiti, confronting racists, or protecting minorities and vulnerable people in your community from hateful behavior, contributing to bail funds of arrested Antifa, or being willing to shout down and shut down Nazis in your city, we all have a part to play in this fight. As Naomi Klein wrote in that same post-election article, people have a right to be angry, and a powerful intersectional left agenda can direct that anger where it belongs, while fighting for holistic solutions that will bring a frayed society together. So whether you identify as Antifa or fight fascism under, under a different banner, let's work together, fight together, and build together on the front lines. Now, moving on to the front lines of extreme energy. Last Thursday, four activists with the group Beyond Extreme Energy were arrested at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, commissioner hearing in Washington, D.C., the confirmation hearing was held, as most hearings in the city are, as a half-assed display of democracy, a shitty understudy attempt at showing any actual concern for either regulation or energy. Luckily, activists were there to shut that shit down, delaying the proceedings and making it loudly known that people will stand up, lock down, and fight. As the BXE press release notes, after the hearing was called to order, and introductions occurred, protesters methodically, yet unpredictably, loudly exclaimed, FERC hurts families, shut FERC down, and FERC hurts families, FERC hurts towns. And the future is watching. One protester said, I am compelled to interrupt this because I have seen the damage of climate change. One protester was let out a few hours later while three others were held overnight. Last Thursday's disruptions represent a broad coalition working to shut down FERC's incessant rubber stamping of dirty energy projects, particularly fracking. FERC hurts Shut them down! Shut them down! Shut them down! FERC hurts families! FERC hurts towns! Shut them down! They're killing people! They're killing people in Tennessee! As Lee Stewart, seen there being dragged from the room after locking himself down to the chair, said, FERC is an arm of the oil and gas industries. 
And because of the great violence that FERC inflicts on the world, it is important to do everything possible to stop or delay them. Until FERC is replaced with an agency dedicated to a just transition off of fossil fuels and to a free energy system based on localized renewable energy, business as usual is unacceptable. To learn more about the incredible work that Beyond Extreme Energy is doing, visit beyondextremeenergy.org. And because the aforementioned Lee Stort is one of my activist heroes, allow me to allow him to school everyone on how you do a legit shut that shit down arrest. So to wrap up this week, we're going to give you a little taste of our interview with Scott Crow, well-known anarchist and organizer and author. The following interview will be part one, a small part one, of a two-part interview series, so be sure to tune in next week to catch the second longer half of this interview. We sat down with Scott to discuss some of the same things that I've already touched upon in this week's opening segment, but also a more in-depth discussion and analysis of anarchism and the role of this political theory on today's political stage. Take a look. Anarchy is, is such a broad set of ideas, right? It's, um, even though it has foundations to it, there's many interpretations of it. It's not like a party program or a political party where you can just say, it's these five things and that's all it is. And it's that way for everybody. You know, it's living and dynamic. So what you have a lot in media is people conflating anarchy and anti-fascism, uh, Antifa. Now, in some media that we're dealing with, some corporate and some alternative media, there's people who actually want to sort those ideas and actually want to know what's the difference in these. Because like, there's communists, there's radicals of all stripes that want to, that can participate in Antifa and do anti-fascist stuff. Um, whereas anarchists is a very specific set of ideas. But these, uh, but but then there's a lot of people who have called from the media who don't really want to. They just want the sensational part of it, the, the high energy part of all of it. Um, and they, they they refuse to do that. And so what I've been trying to do and what, what I think many of us have been trying to do is just trying to sort that out as best as we can in navigating the field. And so talk a little bit about like the, the anarchist movement and, uh, you know, the, the, the different tactics that the anarchist movement will use because the whole, as I understand it, uh, autonomy is a big thing with anarchy. And it's not the, a hierarchical system telling you how you need to act at a protest or even telling you what protests you need to be engaged in. So talk about the anarchist movement today. What, what is it really? Okay. Well, one, it's not a movement, and that's a, I think that's a first clarifying point in it. It's, it's actually a bunch of, of, of political and philosophical tendencies, and this is not minutia or I'm not splitting words in it. This is actually, it's just actually different than that. That's why it gets conflated a lot, because anarchy is conflated with anarchism. I mean, I'm sorry, anarchy is conflated with activism a lot, political movements, social movements, but it's not always a part of that. It's actually just ideas. And so really, I mean, anarchy at its root is a, is a living dynamic set of ideas uh, that, that really allow us to have individual autonomy and, and um, liberation, but also work together for collective liberation. Anarchists are very cooperative. Even individual anarchists are very cooperative. Um, and so those two pieces, autonomy and mutual aid, tie into the ideas of being against hierarchy. So that way, like you were mentioning, nobody can tell us what to do. No, there's no political party that's going to tell us how it's going to be. Nobody is the, 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 the leader of the anarchist uh, ideas. And um, so, but there's a couple of other pieces I think I want to talk about that anarchists are engaged in that, that are often different than like Marxist and, and other groups. And I'm not saying that anarchists own these specifically, but we're just framing it in that conversation. And so a couple of those are the, the idea of direct action. So anarchists are willing to engage in direct action. We don't, you know, we are not going to vote our life away. We're not going to appeal to power or those that perceive to have power to give us what we want. We're going to take it. We're going to build it. So we're resisting on one hand, resisting oppression and exploitation on one hand, 
uh, but we're also building and creating on the other hand. So in direct action, that's a spectrum of tactics that can be used. Some of them on one end would be black block, uh, the use of violence, um, the use of property destruction. And on the other end, it, would, it could be like building health clinics and community centers and spaces where people can can live and breathe that are that are horizontal, that are uh, dynamic and living for people also. Um, and there's a couple of other things in there, too. I think that many anarchists engage in solidarity. This is not a core of anarchy, but the idea of solidarity, that our struggles are tied together. So anarchists often end up working with groups out that are not anarchist groups or experience explicitly anarchist, and, um, but using that idea of solidarity that I am trying to help you not because uh, I'm better than you or I, it's because I have access to more resources than you and I want your leg to get up because we will rise together. And so these cores, you know, these core ideas um, are, are all throughout the, the multiple political tendencies of anarchy. And there's not just one. Believe me, living in the subculture of it all, there's a mountain of them. And they all don't get along together. Even if they agree on the same premise of ideas, they may not always get along. And so, you know, you have eco-anarchists. You have syndicalist anarchists who want to do work, uh, worker-related stuff. You have individualist anarchists. You have... Um, uh, isolationists who just want to live it like a hermit, uh, you know, like like in the 1800s on, you know, somewhere. Um, and you have, I mean, there's just multiple tendencies and they all don't get along. There's anarcho-feminism. I mean, there's just so many strains of it. Again, they all have very core root ideas that are similar, but they've taken different directions. And that's the beauty of it, because think about anarchy like a forest. Do you know how, like, if you're in the sky, like all forests can look the same. A forest on the East Coast or a forest on the West Coast will look the same. But when you get down to it, you'll see that the forest is very different, even though they have very similar elements to them. The little ecosystems that make the, the forest on the East Coast is much different than the one on the West Coast. Well, anarchy is the same way. It looks different everywhere. And that's one of the beauties of it. Again, this is the shorter half of our two-part interview series with anarchist author and organizer Scott Crow. so do tune in next week to see the second and longer half. And with that, we will wrap this week's Dose of Dissent. In the meantime, please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. And thank you for watching, as always. Check out the last slide to see the, all the sites mentioned in this week's show, and be sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at Occupy.com slash donate. If you'd like to donate directly to ACT OUT, visit Patreon.com slash ACT OUT.